Uh, thanks for joining us. This is our, our final webinar in the Transgender Health series from NNLM. Um, we started this on March 31st, uh, International Day of Transgender Visibility. And um, we, those recordings will be put up on the NNLM webpage for those of you that, that weren't able to join. So today we, um, I'll have Molly put the chat. You do uh, receive one CE credit from the Medical Library Association if you complete the evaluation after the webinar. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure that you um, follow that link and complete the webinar. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You can see this, right? We can see it. Okay, just making sure. All right, so um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction for those that are not familiar with NNLM and what we do. Before that, this is uh, the land acknowledgement. So we're currently working from home, but typically our offices are at UCLA. The NNLM PSR at UCLA Biomedical Library acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva communities. And because we love using our acronyms, I always like to give an explanation of what these mean. So at the top, we have the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which is made up of 27 different institutes and centers. The National Library of Medicine is one of those 27 different institutes. It's also the world's largest biomedical library. And underneath that, we have the network of the National Library of Medicine, which is where I work, and April Wright, who is my um, co-conspirator in this series. Uh, she's at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, and here in the Pacific Southwest region, um, as of now, until April, the end of April, um, it's housed at the UCLA Biomedical Library. So the mission of the NNLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve the public health by providing all U.S. health professionals with equal access to biomedical information and improving the public's access to information to enable them to make informed decisions about their health. The program is coordinated by the National Library of Medicine and carried out through a nationwide network of health science, health science libraries and information centers, along with public libraries and um, community-based organizations. So basically anyone that's providing health information. We are also successful in thanks to our individual membership and we encourage all of you to do so. Uh, you can see what other resources and services are available to you. Sign up at nnlm.gov slash user slash join. And you'll be placed on our email list and you'll receive um, notifications of all of the new classes across all of the different regions. So across all of the US, um, a wide variety of health topics, health needs and speakers, such as Dr. Massey who's joining us today. And I'll go ahead and read um, this bio. Dr. Massey, he, his, is a licensed psychologist who has practiced in the Atlanta area for over 30 years. Dr. Massey has served on the board of directors of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, and on the faculty of the WPATH Global Education Initiative. After serving on the GEI steering group, he is now the co-chair slash mental health chair of the WPATH GEI. He is also on the committee to update the Adolescents Chapter and the People Living in Institutions Chapter of the w WPATH Standards of Care for people who are transgender and gender nonconforming. Dr. Massey has published on several topic areas, including gender identity, and he presents seminars primarily on gender identity issues. He has provided training in the USA and abroad for mental and medical health care professionals and students community groups and faculty and staffs of numerous schools as well as universities. He is an adjunct pr assistant professor in the Emory University School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. 
So thank you so much for joining us and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Nora. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to be with you today. I want to start by telling you that my older sister uh, retired about a year ago from a long career as a librarian. And she's told me a lot about her experiences as a manager of a library. And so I have a very um, special place in my heart for the work that all of y'all do. And it's really great to be with you, especially because I love to do things that are gonna help increase access to information about transgender healthcare, uh, including for professionals and the public. So I'm gonna start by uh, sharing my screen. So we're gonna take a minute to do our technology shift over here. Uh, we had an intricate show here in that we're involving two sets of slides, Nora's and then mine. So at any rate, here's some uh, you know, the things we're gonna cover. And I talk kind of quickly, because I'm gonna try to cover a lot of info and try to allow some time at the end for Q&A. So I wanna cover some foundational information about transgender and gender diversity issues, terms and etiquette, which I always think my uh, old fashioned Southern mother would be happy to hear me talking about etiquette, uh, school, work, faith, social, mental health concerns for this population, as well as what community and organization leaders can do. So we're gonna jump right in by talking about what I call a ladder of assumptions that most of us are raised with here in uh, the United States. And that ladder goes something like this, that there are two sets of people we believe. Uh, we're trained in, in school and in biology classes and, and in the culture that uh, we can recognize either at birth or in utero that there are gonna be people we're gonna call male. Uh, and we're gonna make that decision based on the assumption that they have XY chromosomes based on what we believe we see as the testicles and penis, again, either at birth or in utero. And then this thing is gonna be done to these individuals. And that thing is a legal thing is gonna be assigned to them in terms of a male gender marker. And this is something all of us have done to us at birth. A gender marker is assigned without our consent. And it is then assumed these individuals are gonna take on a male gender identity. It was so assumed that the term gender identity wasn't even talked about until recent decades. And then it was also assumed that these individuals would take on a male gender role and all those expectations and the expressions of typical male gender role behavior, including being attracted to females. A, a similar set of assumptions was made of people who seemed at birth or in utero to have a vagina, and they were assumed to have XX chromosomes and assigned a female gender marker, assumed to take on a female gender identity, and then a female gender role and expectations and expression, including being attracted to males. So as I started working in this field, it was useful for me to do some research and be reminded that actually there's a lot of biology. If we look at that ladder of assumption, just starting with the biological factors, there's a lot of biology outside the binary. So what am I talking about for those of you who may not be sure what I'm talking about? The, the common phrase uh, in the community that works with this population is intersex. Um, the, this is for folks who may have uh, reproductive organs of both sexes or of neither sex, or they may have ambiguous uh, genitalia. These, uh, the clinical term for this uh, population is disorder of sex development. However, in the field where I work, we often call it differences of sex development. I really like that term difference because it connotes that variation is a biological normal occurrence. That if, if we could see all of our faces on the screen here today, we would see various skin colors, various hair colors, various hair textures and shapes. Our bodies, our builds, our different heights, widths, even people of the same heights are going to have different frames and shapes and sizes. So variation is biologically normal. 
So what are a couple of examples that can lead to these folks having different kinds of uh, genitalia and reproductive structures? Well, there are hormonal, hormonal variations such as complete or andro, uh, partial androgen insensitivity, which leads to the feminization of individuals who have XY chromosomes. Or there's congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which leads to the masculinization of folks with XX chromosomes. Chromosomal variations include Klinefelter syndrome, which means the person has multiple X's and a Y. And another variation is Turner's, where there's one X and then a blank on the other X, on the other chromosome in the pair of uh, chromosomes, typically called the sex chromosomes. So that alone was very helpful for me to start realizing, oh yeah, if biology is outside the binary, huh, you know, maybe that ladder isn't working. And in fact, I understand that in y'all's uh, talk last uh, presentation last week, you were introduced to a transgender woman and uh, Aria Lester, I believe, and here are some other transgender women and in the top left, we have Cecilia Chung, a transgender activist in America. In the top center is Zhu Jing, the first woman officially to transition in China. Top right is Lana Wachowski of the Wachowski brothers, formerly and now the Wachowski sisters. And they gave us such fine entertainment as the Matrix Trilogy and Cloud Atlas. And then in the bottom right is Isis King, a model and actress in the States. And in the bottom left is Angela Ponce, who competed in the Miss Universe contest in 2018. So there are a number of examples you have there of transgender women. So that's a reminder that not everybody's gender identity matches the gender marker that was assigned to them at birth. So let's go a little further down that ladder. You know, it's important to understand that gender is a social construct. The roles and expectations of gender are often taught and enforced by family, by peers, by schools, by religions, uh, by the media and culture. And these gendered interactions can start at birth, even including things like the color blankets that people get for babies. And society monitors these uh, rules and people's adherence to them uh, pretty strictly, although it's starting to shift and loosen up with the younger generation. So gender expression is how we rock our particular version of our gender role. So, you know, the, it's our haircuts, it's our hairstyles, but even here we see gender differences, but it's, it's clear that we all have ways in which we want to present our gender and our personality get to come through. What I like in this next slide is that Billy Porter, who is a star on the series Pose, I believe that's on Netflix, is you know really rocking this gown that she wore, he wore to the, um, to the Oscars a few years ago, and it is gender non-conforming. You know, he's not going with the gender role expectations, but is doing a gender expression that is different and is really striking, really striking. Similarly, we have another variation here. We have Ellen DeGeneres, who, as far as I know, identifies as female, but as most of us know, she's out as a lesbian and she often presents in very masculine attire. But she's also a cover girl. I've seen her in the uh, you know, ads in the magazines. And so she is doing all sorts of bending that ladder of assumptions. So it's useful for all of us then to start recognizing that when we're thinking about working with folks, we want to think about what I call heteronormative clarifications. We call these, uh, in the field, we call this heteronormative when folks just adhere to the binary and those expectations that we are, were most of us brought up with, that we would be male or female and we'd be attracted to males or females. And uh, it would be heterosexual, 
So in terms of our attractions. And so we have the term heteronormative. And if you have teenagers and you're able to use the term heteronormative at dinner this evening, you might impress them. Um, but when I look at this field, I think now we clearly recognize that while that set of heteronormative expectations works for a lot of people, for the majority of the population even, there's a lot of folks it doesn't work for. And so we need to think about genetics, that the chromosomes and the hormones we have are separate from the legal label that we have, which some people are or are not able to change when they go through a gender transition. And the legal label can be different than somebody's inner experience of their gender identity. And so sometimes, again, somebody may not be able to get their legal label to change depending on what state or country they live in. Their gender role is their social presentation, which may or may not align with their gender identity. And then sexual orientation, fortunately, for a number of years now, we've had uh, more awareness that sexual orientation can be uh, not at all related to somebody's uh, chromosomal and legal uh, gender assigned at birth. So what are we talking about then in terms of frequency? In recent research, what we're finding is that on average, and I say average, about 1% of folks are identifying as transgender. Old research, a lot lower numbers and older uh, participants in studies, lower numbers. However, Teens are often saying around 1.5% of the population is identifying as transgender. And very interestingly, about 2% identifying as non-binary or other gender identities. I'm gonna talk a little more about that in a minute. So think about that in your population. If you're in a city where there's 1 million people, that means that about 10,000 of them are identifying as transgender and 20,000 as gender questioning or non-binary or other identities. This is much higher than if you look in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, and a lot of older studies. And I will tell you my office, I don't know, that this two or three calls, I may need to update this slide. It feels like I get four or five calls a week because I've got a waiting list of two to three months for people to see me. And it's really important to let you know that you know, this is a phenomenon that occurs across all walks of life. My practice, I see folks very diverse, racially, ethnically, socioeconomic, education, uh, religion, age, and abilities. So there is a lot of diversity. Now, one thing that's really interesting in doing this work is it is a very evolving field. In the last 10 years alone, there's been a tremendous shift in vocabulary. And uh, especially because I work with young people, they're coming up with new terms all the time and I have to stay humble and willing to learn. Now, more or less in the field, we've agreed upon transgender as an umbrella term to identify folks who don't identify with the gender marker assigned to them at birth. The best known, of course, are, you know, like on that slide, some of the trans women or women uh, a lot of times people don't even want to be called trans now, they just want to be called a woman. Uh, formerly male to female was common, M to F. I always encourage using the terminology that people use in referring to themselves if they come to see you in, their li in your library or send you an email request. And then of course, trans men or, or men, female to male, formerly F to M is the other best known groups. Cisgender applies to a lot of folks. In fact, most of the population is cisgender. That means that your gender identity matches the gender marker assigned to you at birth. So there are some other terms I said I would talk about a little bit. And we have some umbrella terminology that continues to evolve for folks who are gender expansive or gender and creative. So a very common term you might see is gender non-conforming. That's actually starting to give way some, but it is somewhat applicable. Like some might say that Ellen is gender non-conforming in her presentation because she tends to wear more masculine attire. 
non-binary or gender non-binary, a lot of folks are identifying as this. That may mean they identify with no gender label. They don't identify as male or female. They may identify with neither or with both, or it may be fluid. Another term that is really coming into vogue at this point, and, and I think it's gonna really stick around for a while, it's gotten a lot of traction, is gender diverse. So folks who may not be male or female, binary identified, but maybe they're gender non-conforming, maybe they're non-binary, maybe they're both. So uh, this is some ongoing terminology that we're adapting nowadays. And then gender variant is an older term that you may still see in some research, but it's not used as much now, but obviously it's referring to folks who aren't conforming to typical expectations for gender exp uh, expression or gender experience. So I just wanna give you um, a reminder that Again, since some of these folks are not necessarily binary identified, they may not need to take some of the typical steps of a gender transition, uh, but they also may not fit in typical heteronormative expectations. And uh, there are some folks who may transition or take some steps medically or surgically or may not. They may or may not take legal steps. They may or may not take social steps of transition. It all depends on what their particular needs are. So just as one example of somebody who's gender non-conforming or gender diverse, we might think about Eddie Izzard, who, if you've never seen him, I encourage you to see him. He's hilarious. He's a very talented comedian and actor. He was in uh, the show The Riches, and he was on The Good Wife, played a very uh, buttoned up accountant in that series. He is a British, uh, of British origin, and he can make world history hilarious in several different languages. And he wears on his stand-up routine, usually the outfit that he's, something like the outfit on the right, which uh, I think is really fetching. When I've done this talk, some of the audiences I speak to, the women are like, oh, I want those shoes. So I wanna tell you a little bit before we proceed much further about how I got into this area because I didn't expect to be doing this work when I started um, my career back in 1989 after finishing my PhD. There was not a lot of work on gender issues and transgender work in the 1980s. But when I look back in my life, you know, I was born in 1962, so I'll do my math for you. I'm 58. And growing up in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of stuff going on in, this, in the US about gender because of the women's liberation movement. And I was very interested in that because I always thought that the rules for girls and women were kind of stupid. I thought some of the rules for men and boys were kind of stupid. I particularly didn't like the rules for women and girls because I was assigned a female gender marker at birth. I was raised a girl. And I felt really constrained by the expectations and roles that I saw in my future. Now, as a little kid, my parents and everybody thought it was cute that I was a tomboy and kind of did more typical boyish things, playing with cars and army men and football with the guys, Hot Wheels. But, uh, you know, as I got a little older, I started feeling this social pressure to conform to expectations of girls. And it was really uncomfortable for me. And I'm going to ask you all to think for a moment about this person going into the girls' locker room in middle school and in high school. And Maybe that sounds like, oh, that's great if you like little girls and you're attracted to girls at that age. But no, it was really uncomfortable. I felt very awkward, like I'm not supposed to be here, but I couldn't say why. I didn't have the vocabulary to explain it. And this was back in the dark ages before uh, computers and the internet and this thing we have called Google. So I just like, well, I guess I'm just going to make the best of it and try to adhere to the expectations. But I remember telling another kid when I was about eight or nine that I wanted to be a boy. 
I, I just didn't know how to do that. So in high school, I also started learning about being attracted to girls and the term lesbian. And I didn't hear a lot of people talking about it. So I didn't talk about it either. But I did come out in my 20s. And, um, you know, I told you my parents were fine with me being a tomboy, but they were very conservative and traditional in their ways of thinking and being. And uh, they didn't take well to this news that I was a lesbian, which, by the way, kind of cracks me up to say now with this face. Um, but, you know, my siblings and my parents struggle with this, particularly my parents. And it was really a challenge. But over the next couple of decades, you know, I found a place, a community with the lesbian and gay community. I finished graduate school. I became known by my colleagues in the Georgia Psychological Association or GPA. And I did a lot of work and, and became um, respected for my work as a lesbian activist and educator in GPA and in the public in the Atlanta area. And, you know, was fortunate in my 40s to have a stable practice, to have a very good partner of about 10 years. My stepdaughter was nearly done with college. And so my life was in a really stable place and a lot of calm. And I believe that allowed me to hear that something was missing. Something still wasn't right. And even though I was pretty successful and happy and blessed in my life, something was still missing for me. And what I started getting in touch with was that I had more masculinity in me that needed more expression. And even though my hair had kept getting shorter and shorter and my attire had gotten more and more masculine over the years, I was not fully comfortable. So spoiler alert, I recognized, realized over my own counseling, journaling, prayer, meditation that I needed to go through a gender transition. And I did that. I started that process um, medically about 11 years ago. And at, that was after a couple of years of soul searching and struggle to really sort this out. And let me tell you, it was terrifying. As a veteran of two comings out, it was much harder coming out as trans. Because when you come out as trans, if you want to transition in place, meaning you don't want to lose your whole community, that means you got to tell everybody in your community. When you come out as gay or lesbian, you don't have to necessarily discuss it with your mechanic or your accountant or whatever. But I have relationships for years and years and years that I wanted to come along with me. You know, I, I wanted my friends and my colleagues to, to be supportive and to be in the know. And so I had to tell all of them. I had to tell all of my clients. I had to tell my landlord or my office building. I had to tell my accountant who'd done my books for my business for years, decades. I had to tell my dentist who it might not seem like I, you have to tell your dentist, but if you're going to look different and sound different over time, then they need to know what's going on. It'd be weird. Had to tell my pharmacist, had to tell my auto mechanic, because it's hard to find a really good, trustworthy auto mechanic. So there are so many people I had to tell. Oh, and my neighbors. So they wouldn't be wondering who's walking the dog now. Uh, so it was exhausting. But I want to tell you about two really important people or groups of people I came out to. My colleagues, you know, it was it was such a blessing because they knew my history of being a hard worker and straightforward. And so they invited me to continue to do things for GPA, the Georgia Psychological Association. In fact, I was invited to chair the annual conference. And that's a big responsibility. And I worked really hard because I was not going to be the first transgender person to chair it and to mess it up. I didn't want to break it. And so uh, it was a sellout 
uh, conference and was very well received. And then they asked me to run for president. I declined when they first asked me to run for president because I know now in, in hindsight that intuitively I realized I was too early in my transition. I hadn't grown into myself enough to know who I was and to hold my ground as a man. But they asked me again in 2016. And at that point, I said, yes, I'm, I'm willing to accept this nomination. And I was elected and I served as the GPA president in 2017, 2018. And I am so grateful to my colleagues that they entrusted me with my professional association because it's been my home community for now three decades. And I am so close to so many of the people there. And it's where I have grew up professionally in many ways. And it's been an honor to be able to lead that organization, to be able to preside over board meetings, to represent GPA at the state legislature, to advocate for mental health for the public, and to even do that at the US Capitol with our federal legislators. It has been an honor to be able to serve my profession in this professional organization because they trusted me. And I tell this story because it's important for parents and families and so many people to know that when given a chance and recognized for our strengths and capacities, trans people want to and are able to com contribute in many ways that we are thrilled to be able to do. And it is also something that I would not have done before my transition because I realize now I felt too inhibited. I felt too internally conflicted. There was energy bound up in that. And I did not want the kind of high profile demands of being the president of an organization. But they trusted me and I was able to be my authentic self. And that allowed me to show up and bring all of myself to that endeavor. Finally, it's hardest to talk about telling my family. I mailed letters to my family because when I had come out as a lesbian, it had been very difficult, very painful. There had been a lot of conflict. And so I thought, I'm going to write them letters. I thought for sure I was going to lose my family over this. If, if being a lesbian was hard, I'm going to totally lose them over this. But I have to be me. And I wrote them letters and thought that way they can think about it, process it. If they're going to have a meltdown or a hard time with it. Then they can contact me later and we can talk about it in a time and a place where they've had a little time to cool down. I'll never forget. I had conversations with each of them at different times after they received my letters, but I'll never forget the call from my From my mother, my parents were in their 70s at this point. And my mom said, your father had to go to his barbershop quartet rehearsal. But he said, he said to say, hello, son. And my parents both passed away a few years ago, but in the seven years since then, since I came out to them, they got to know me as their son and to affirm me and embrace me. And my father embraced me in that way, as did my mother, even before I had any surgical or hormonal treatment. And so it was very, very affirming for me and such a relief to have their affirmation and their support for who I was and who I am. So 
my hand slipped and hit some of the slides that I wanted to tell you about next, because I think that as much as it means to me, as a 58 year old man, I want you to think about how important this is to kids, to adolescents, to even young adults. And what we see is that there are higher rates of homelessness, sex work, and suicide attempts for people whose families reject them when they come out as trans. There are much lower rates, but still there are high rates of homelessness, sex work, and suicide attempt, even when there's family acceptance. But I work with a lot of youth, and this is really important information for parents and families to have. So working with youth, another thing that I get from a lot of parents, and I'm going to come back to some of this information, but a question I often get from parents is, can't they just be gay? Now, this kind of cracks me up because when I started my practice in the 90s, they would never have said that. But I explained to them, sexual orientation and gender identity are different. You can be cisgender, as most people are, and gay, lesbian, straight, bi, pan, poly, ace, et cetera. But guess what? You can also be transgender and be all of those things. So for example, I know some transgender guys who look like me, they're attracted to men. So they are gay men, gay trans men. There are transgender women who are attracted to women, they're lesbians. Transgender women attracted to men and women, they're bisexual or attracted to folks regardless of their gender identity, they're pansexual. They're attracted to men, they're heterosexual. I used to be attracted to women, so I was a lesbian. I am still attracted to women. So now I'm a straight white dude. I never saw that coming in my life, I promise you. So I want to talk about pronouns. Y'all may have heard a lot about pronouns, and it is really important in this population and in terms of working with etiquette. They, them, they was the word of the year for Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary in 2019. And it became approved for single use in many style guides like the American Psychological Association for, uh, as in referring to a singular individual. And so I say this so that you have a better understanding like that this has really happened in our society that they is actually codified. So here is a little bit more about that. Now, when people are like, why they, them? You know, and they, this is often a pronoun of choice for folks who identify as non-binary or non-conforming. So what's the point? Is it to drive English teachers crazy? Well, maybe a little bit. Um, is it to demonstrate difference from parents? Uh, any adolescent's gonna love to do that. Confuse any of us north of 40, mayhaps. Get a little psychological elbow room, uh-huh and create some social change or all of the above. You know, I grew up in an era where there were newspapers and in the newspapers, there was universal use of masculine pronouns and there was racist language where the, only the people who were not white were had their race identified. But those norms have changed. And as we see with Merriam-Webster, terminology is changing. So I invite you to honor when people tell you they go by they, them pronouns. So I'm gonna talk about a little data. In fact, that slide I had earlier about the risks of family rejection, they're from this US trans survey, which is available at this website. Um, and this survey involved over 27,000 adults in the US, 18 and up into their 80s. And a really important thing, again, as I work with young people, is to make sure people know that there is a, a misconception that all trans people know by age three, four, five, that they're trans. And that's simply not the case. These adults reported this range of ages when they knew. 
that they were transgender or that their gender identity wasn't matching what they were told they were, even if maybe they didn't have the word. Now, what's really interesting to me and is really important uh, medically speaking and with parents is we see this huge jump at age 11 to 15, whereas only a quarter of kids figured it out before age 10, 28% get it in the 11 to 15 age range. What's happening then? Puberty and the, the increase of sex segregated activities, locker rooms, school activities, and gender role expectations get more sex segregated too. And then we get another jump of 29% who figure it out in the age 16 to 20 because they're recognizing, oh, I maybe even I tried, but my gender is not fitting me what is expected of me. And then there's the rest of us who are the late to the party, figure it out people um, over age 20. I talked briefly about education because again, so many of these folks are figuring out when they're young. Now, over three fourths of people who are trans or out as trans indicated they were mistreated or assaulted in the age uh, grades K through 12. So what, is that, what does that look like? It means they were called the wrong name, the wrong pronoun, had to use the wrong restroom or locker room, were uh, ostracized, made fun of, had to wear the wrong uniform. And that ostracism and ridicule can be by teachers, staff, as well as students. <coughs> they also have been not only verbally assaulted, but perhaps physically and even sexually assaulted. I've worked with some of these young people who it felt like going to school was like going to a war zone. So it's not surprising that 17% of them leave school as a result. Now, this is much better in the college years. Only uh, almost a fourth report mistreatment, but still it's happening. So it's important to recognize that. What do you think the impact of leaving school is? Higher unemployment rates because they have fewer job skills, fewer credentials. So as a result, fewer people own homes. People are going maybe into blue collar jobs, unskilled jobs, where they get more abuse. People of color were often faring worse. Again, this is from the US Trans Survey. Many more people, twice the rate of the US average, living in poverty. And again, a number going into underground economies like sex work, drug sales, and other criminalized behavior. So I wanna to touch on a topic that's really relevant, relevant here, and that is intersectionality. A term coined in 1991 by Kimberly Kim, yeah. Kimberly Crenshaw, excuse me. And she was highlighting that we need to understand that when people of any minority group um, are encountering the world as we know it, they have um, less advantage, less privilege, less power accessing the resources. You know, part of my being able to have such a successful transition is that I have education and I am Caucasian appearing and now I blend in very easily as a male. But when people are not straight white male assumed cisgender, they are gonna be having fewer and fewer privileges. Women get paid less on the dollar. Women of color get paid even less on the dollar to, to men. So these are examples. If you look at who's sitting on the boards of corporations and in our legislative houses, we see the access to power decreases. And if you put in more minority statuses, they aren't just additive, it's almost multiplicative. And it's hard to, to exactly come up with an algorithm, but all these things, can make it harder and harder to get resources and to be treated fairly in culture, our, our country. So if we look at certain social conditions, what we see is, again, looking at some of that population data, the US population in general, at the time of the survey, 14% were living in poverty. All respondents in the US trans survey 
twice as many in poverty, more in black respondents and even more Latinx respondents. We see higher unemployment rates. We see higher rates of um, HIV infection and even look at black trans women, they've got the highest rates of HIV infection. This is the result of intersectionality because these women often don't blend as well. They have fewer educational advantages um, and they maybe have been more bullied in school. And these are all because they have experienced external stressors. These external stressors come from what we call macroaggressions and microaggressions. So what is a macroaggression? Structural aggressions in institutions and systems. So for example, during the prior administration in Washington, DC, it was uh, instituted that there was a ban on transgender people serving in the military. That is codified discrimination to say that I am not qualified to serve in the military just because I'm transgender. Other ways we might see this are institutions like HR policies or in insurance policies that don't cover transgender benefits, but they cover, cover other benefits. Or the same medications may be covered for treating some conditions, but if it's used for a trans condition, then it's not paid for. That's discrimination. Microaggressions come with uh, being enacted by individuals or small groups. And this is a term used by Chester Pierce, who was on the faculty uh, at Harvard as a psychiatrist. And he observed that the white students were often making denigrating comments and behaviors toward their black classmates without even recognizing it. And so he called these microaggressions, it could be overt or covert, unintentional, in, in, uh, uh, intentional or unintentional. And they aren't named micro because they're small, but because it was an individual doing it. And I'll tell you, I have been in circumstances where people have not known that I was transgender and have said negative things about trans people, so that was a microaggression that I experienced and it affects my stress level going out in the world. That's just a small example. I could give you stories and stories after this. I can also tell you that since I am perceived as a straight white man who is assumed to be cisgender, I encounter so many more microaggressions against women, uh, against people of color, and against LGBT folks, because people think that I have a certain history and belief system. And I now have this privilege that I didn't ask for, but I try to use it for good and to debunk people's assumptions uh, when they express such microaggressions. Other places we see those microaggressions are gonna be in public settings for this is again, trans folks indicated in the past year on the US trans survey that when they were out or perceived as trans, perhaps for example, their identification didn't match their presentation, they would be um, verbally harassed in public, denied treatment verbally or sexually or physically assaulted. Similarly, People have those treatments in restrooms. And so what do they do? They avoid the restrooms. I want to tell you, 60% almost said they avoided the restrooms. A third of them did that by reducing their food and drink intake. Think about that. I don't know about you, but I don't work so well when I'm hungry or thirsty. Think about children trying to learn when they're trying to avoid the restrooms and by not eating and not drinking. 8% reported having medical complications as a result. UTIs, urinary tract infections, kidney infections. A mother told me about having to take her child to the emergency room because the child became so constipated their bowels were impacted, which is a condition that can be life-threatening. Sadly, in a lot of faith communities, people encounter discrimination as well, or people just leave their faith communities because they expect to get rejected. And sadly, only about 40% 
found a more welcoming faith community. So what does this do? This creates what we call minority stress, which takes a toll on our mental health. And you know that slide on suicide attempts, the, the small blue dots here represent the, the average American population. 5% in the past month indicated having serious psychological distress, but in the US trans survey, 39%. Again, almost 4.5% indicated suicide attempt in the US population at large, but in the trans population, 40%, which is the halfway point of the 33% who are accepted by family versus the 50% who are rejected by their families. This 40% number is consistent across a lot of studies. So what can you do for your trans employees or people seeking information, your coworkers? Ask and use the names and pronouns that people want to go by. And even if it takes a little effort, you can develop a new part in your brain. I promise you that you're all smart folks. You can develop that muscle in your brain to call them the name and pronoun they use. However, it's also important to ask them who knows, like if they're coming out to you, like you're their boss or coworker, you ask who do they want you to use this in front of or who do they not want you to use it in front of? And sometimes you're the first person they've told and so you wanna be careful. Now, another thing you can do is make sure not to ask about surgeries or anything beyond your level of intimacy with a person. Right? If you're not gonna be their doctor or dating them, you don't really need to know about all their medical treatments. Um, if you're their boss and they need time off, they can tell you when they're gonna need time off for a surgical procedure, but you don't need to ask about a lot of stuff. You can ask how you can help. That's always useful. And a really supportive comment is thank you for telling me. That's a really neutral comment and an it, it shows respect for somebody confiding in you or coming out to you, which is an act of courage, I'm telling you, and trust. And then some people will be offended if you say, I could never tell you were born, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't look like a female. Um, I don't take offense at it, but I know people who are offended by it. I will also tell you there are people now who are treated with hormones so early that they blend in so well, you would have no idea that they were transgender. And saying this is gonna potentially be insulting. Um, it may come to light if you hire them, but then they have a gender mark that doesn't match. That again is because in some states, there is not a provision for changing your gender marker legally. So if somebody's gender marker doesn't match, please uh, be very cautious about ever using that phrase I could never tell. All right, so a little bit more. Your organization can consider doing some things like looking at your language. Like if you're having activities or addressing the crowd, if you say ladies and gentlemen, that's very binary, very heteronormative, old school. Everybody is very inclusive. Or down in the South here, we say y'all. And that's a really handy, um, all-inclusive term. Look at your bathrooms. Are there signs? Are they inclusive? Are they all gender? Do you have some family in all gender restrooms? Perhaps allowing space for or inviting a support group for trans gender diverse folks or sofas, significant others, friends, family, and allies. That's the trans pride flag there, by the way. All right, your organization can also look at your forms like your electronic records, uh, and any paperwork you may have, if you still have old school paperwork, do you use male and female? Do you only use those? Because if you do, that's gonna be uninviting versus if you include trans woman, trans man, non-binary or additional, not other, but additional. Look at activities. Do you need to divide activities up again? If you're a school librarian of any type, university librarian, or do we not need to divide things? Or can they be divided up based on day of the year you were born or month of the year you were born, odds and evens? Look at the insurance policies, non-discrimination clauses, where you are, where you're working. So as librarians, you're gonna be looking in all sorts of journals, 
it's amazing how many, you know, psychiatry, psychology, social work to cover all of these different areas because it's such a multifaceted field for mental health, medical, surgical, hormonal, primary health care, reproductive issues, policies, et cetera. So you're going to have journals you're going to be dealing with in all of these areas. I want to tell you briefly, uh, got just a few more slides here, then I'll stick around a little late for q and I'm sorry I'm running a little late, just got so much I'd like to share with y'all. But WPATH uh, is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health again, and we have guidelines from 2011, Standards of Care version 7, SOC 7, currently being updated to version 8, and uh, there are also some models of informed consent that are used um, for starting hormones, but most uh, medical practices, insurance companies, courts of law um, will use the standards of care from WPATH. So one other set of resources uh, I'm going to point you to, WPATH.org, is indo-society.org, the Endocrine Society, put out its latest guidelines in 2017. But I tell you, all these mainstream healthcare uh, professional associations also have guidelines, the AMA, the APA, uh, AAP, and ACAP, as well as there being conferences for lay folks around the globe and around the states, like gender spectrum. And these are very useful for them to learn about uh, policies, about healthcare, about getting support for their gender questions and their gender journeys. So I want to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, sorry, I'm running a little ran a little late. I know it's right at three. I will stick around for some questions, and I'm going to stop my screen share so that Nora can put back up the slide she had and can um, say, you know, y'all can toss me any questions you like at this point, okay? That sounds good. Thank you so, so much. I, you know, you, you were able to see the chat, but I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. <laughs> we're just, we're very, very grateful and, and honored to have you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I don't think I saw any direct questions. I do see a hand raised, um, Michael, Michael Scholenbeck. I sent you a, a private message. Um, so if you want to put your question in the chat or, oh, I see, okay, they lowered their hand. Um, but. Okay, so I do see one question. If you forget someone's pronouns, is it safest to use they in the moment? Uh, I think that's a, nice, that's a nice question. That is a good default safe uh, uh, step to take. Yes, that's probably a safe step to take. You know, and in private, you can just say, I'm sorry, I forgot, I, but I didn't wanna out you. Can you please tell me? By the way, if you're ever in a social situation and you drop a pronoun, which happens to all of us, uh, then you just say, I'm sorry, and correct yourself and say he, and then continue with your story or your whatever you're engaged in. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I Please feel free to put your, your questions in the chat. Oh, okay, we have another one. I have a question. They is or they are. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I'll, I'll use it like this. Um, I saw a kid earlier today and they told me they want to have their name respected. And I refer to them this way. Uh, they are, you know, not wanting to be called their old name their, and their old pronoun. They are wanting to be called their current gender and their gender identification. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah, Fred, let us know if 
Yeah. And I think there had been a question about resources also, especially for young people. A really good book for parents and for um, clinicians and allies uh, for young people. There are two really good ones. One is The Transgender Child. And um, then later by Brill, B-R-I-L-L and Pepper. And another um, book by, I think Stephanie Brill uh, wrote it and I can't remember her co-author's name. Um, the next one was The Transgender Teen. So, uh, but there are a lot of really good books. And, it, and I tell you, if you, um, I don't know about how your medical library systems work, but I know on um, major book selling sites that if you enter a couple of those things, they will then offer you a whole bunch of others to look into. Thank you. Uh, Br it was Brill and Pepper, the transgender child. Yeah, I'm, I found an Amazon link to it. I was trying to avoid using an Amazon link, but. <laughs> I avoided using the word, so. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, there's the Amazon link. I, uh, I didn't have time to look up the OCLC or WorldCat. Um, but yeah, um, okay. No, you don't say they is, you say they are. Even when you're talking about a singular person. Okay, yeah. And that's, I think that's the, the follow up to Fred's mm -hmm. question. Um, I, I put a link earlier. I just got a notice. I got a ping that the Library of Congress today, about four hours ago, they just passed the brand new collections policy statements for LGBTQIA plus uh, studies, as well as women's and, and gender studies. So, you know, if, if you're working in a library and information setting um, and you need you know, support, you want to start creating a collections policy, that's an official um, resource that you can, you can go to. So that's history in the making, uh, you know, from the Library of Congress, as well as us uh, at the National Library of Medicine. So thank you again, we can't uh, thank you enough for, for being a part of this historical moment as well. You know, we have a lot that we are are facing and going up against with different states um you know didn't denying access trying to deny access to people's very personal medical care um, with these bills that they're trying to pass so i'm really glad that we have experts like you who are representative of the populations that that we are supporting and so i take this as a sign of hope that you know we will continue to progress forward. Yes, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I think that uh, it may take a while, but as more people get to know um, trans people, you know, I think part of what changed so many people's minds about uh, same-sex marriage and gay and lesbian and bisexual rights is that so many people came out to them and they got to know some examples or get to know them in their personal lives. And so, um, I'm hoping that by telling my story and now people can be supportive of people who come out to them and can get that, you know, we just want to be productive members of society and have relationships and lives that are meaningful just like anybody else does. And with support and opportunities, we're able to do so. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here with y'all today. <laughs>